How's it going, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Raw or Rules as Written. Uh, my name is Matt Robertson, uh, yep. also known as Grape Ape. And I'm Stefan Surratt, also known as DM Bad Wrong Fun uh, on, uh, you know, just a few lingering social media platforms these days. Now, Stefan, this is the first uh, first um, episode where we don't have a guest. Uh, but I oh, just we did got that one where we, we talked about third party publishing. We didn't have any guests there. So, but yeah, it's it's been a long time, though, uh, you know, and that one on scheduling. I, I did just get a message back from Bruce, though, so let me... Oh, okay, me, uh, so we might have our surprise he guest. He is going to be coming in. Uh, Bruce, uh, also known as Brucifer, on the uh, server. Uh, he is on the Dungeon Crawler server quite a bit. Uh, has been a long-time member. Uh, and we are going to add him as our guest. Now, normally, uh, every fourth episode, we would have Bob Brinkman on. But... Mm -hmm. Bob's got some stuff going on, just moved to a new house. Uh, he's a busy guy. You know, he's writing stuff. He's working. I think tax time is coming up, too. Not, <laughs> not too far away, right? Like five, more five months away. How soon can you start filing your taxes? Uh, not until the beginning of the new year. So he's, he's, he's well, I have no clue what, <laughs> what his schedule looks like, but I imagine it's a going to be calm for about another three months anyway uh we need to go to our, our little technical screen so we can uh, add our third person all right welcome back everyone and now i feel like the show is back to normal we got a guest with us bruce rusk aka bruce fur on the dungeon crawler server thank you for joining us sir can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your credentials what qualifies you to answer <laughs> these rules questions uh, well, I run a lot of DCC, MCC, and that family of games. I think probably well over 100 sessions in the last couple of years. Um, I run a couple of weekly games. Um, I uh, am a big fan. I play a lot as well, I'm not just running games. I'm a player. I love to play. I'm in an ongoing campaign right now. Um, I've immersed myself pretty deeply into the game in a lot of ways, uh, also in the Dungeon Crawler community, which has hugely expanded my knowledge and uh met awesome guys like you two and uh thank you but yeah so but no i just play a lot run a lot and really just love the game and love to evangelize and talk about it i think uh stefan and i have both of you had you in our games and played in your games so yeah absolutely true. yeah well, yep thank you for coming on and saving our butt you know bob's a busy <laughs> guy uh couldn't make it today but uh i should we give bruce bob's alkalades the uh, we are joined with our special guest today, the Pompadour of pronouncements, the omnipotence of ordainments, the Charles Darwin of determinations, Bruce Rusk. Uh, so, Stefan, we got to go back mm -hmm. all the way to August eighth, where we had James Ponzinel Jr. on, uh, and I think that was uh, episode thirty. And our That's first so, yeah. question for James Bruce was. What is an artificial intelligence in Mutant Crawl Classics? What constitutes an AI in your MCC games? Uh, you know, I, I like to differentiate them from like cyborgs and androids. I, first of all, it's got to be intelligent, right? I think of it as an NPC, right? It's an NPC, a disembodied NPC. Um, you know, I... Uh, curiously, I work in the software industry, and so I think in those terms. And it's, so it's, I think of it like like wetware, like biological intelligence that can be transferred into some sort of uh, electromagnetic device. So okay. being in that industry, do we have any, uh, what, what's the uh, percentage of worry that we need to really con be concerned that AI takes over the world, Bruce? Oh, just two words. So actually just one word, Skynet. Just, you know, that's where we're <laughs> headed. There's no question about it. No, um, who knows? I think it's all in, um, um, yeah, I think that's, that's a little outside of my, uh, my realm. And it's, uh, it's a very volatile subject right now well, in our industry too. People are using it a lot in the gaming world. Um, I prefer to think of it as, uh, smart alecky old, uh, software that's still running after thousands of years in Terra AD. 
I mean, I see it. I I constantly hear things about like, oh, this old jet plane is running off of software from the 80s. And I'm just like, yep. So, you know, they're like, it's unhackable because you got to use a floppy disk or something <laughs> like that. So, yeah, I see it. It's it's going to be on. And, and that's why everything's so difficult in MCC, because you have to find the proprietary way to get into something from 10,000 years ago. All right, Stefan, do you want to hit Bruce with our next question? Me and you will flip back and forth. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, so we're going, how do you make it an artificial intelligence recognition check in MCC? Well, there's a mechanical description of it in the rules, obviously. Um, but I think a lot of it comes into what type of AI it is. So mm -hmm. you think about it, if you read not just uh, the MCC material, but the Appendix N things that spawn from, you know, these AIs tend to have a lot of personality. Think of Hal, Mother, those things, right? Um, so I like to think of it not just as the mechanical part of it, but there's a personality. These things usually have an agenda. So I want to mix that in when they're approaching um, the AI. So I think the mechanical check is good. You need to have something that is recognizable that everybody can sort of pin, you know, their action on. But um, you can't factor out the, you know, the personality, the intangibles of this particular AI. Well, and I think when we're asking Bruce these questions, and Stefan, we got to give him a little context of our previous answers because. He hasn't had any time to review or prepare. Mm -hmm. um, so our third question for James was, when encountering an AI, what modifiers are added for these recognition checks? Because the first thing we got to do is be recognized as a human. Plantians, they, they can't even be seen. Uh, you know, a right. lot of times in modules, you have manimals that, you know, are, are looked at as like pets because they're animals. Um, but if you look like an ancient, you know, if you're wearing clothes of the ancient, there's bonuses for that. Humans get bonuses, whatnot. Or is there anything else that stands out to you, Bruce? Like what would affect these uh, recognition checks? Yeah, I used one recently. So one of the characters in this episode was like a gray, like an alien, like a like a visitor, right? And so they passed because they had seeded earth with their dna millions of years ago to create humankind so the ai says oh you're definitely human mm, sounds like a little america gets mixed into it i was gonna say uh, a hannibal lecter style face mask but that'll I work like too that. oh well that's you're getting into some dcc stuff now i think <laughs> with the carving off of faces but i like it stevin has been hanging out in the shutter mountains too long <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I, hey, I ran that to, to completion all the way from, you know, fuddle to level five with the chain coffin. So I hung out there for uh, a good long while. I played in that. Yeah, it was a good time. It was great. All right. What is our next question, Stefan? Uh, it was after we have that AI check, you know, how can the PC, you said, achieve dominance and mastery over the AI? But may, maybe it's not quite dominance and mastery, but I, I think we're, you know, just at and it's probably going to be very situational. That was a lot of our answers, but you know, what's what's the role play going to be like? What kind of stories do we need to tell? Well, and to give you background, we even had uh, Jim Wampler on here, and he said it, the AI check is just to be able to speak to them. That's it. Mm -hmm. Everything after that is role play heavy on how they uh, act to you. You know. Do you have security clearance? Do they just sweep you out the window? A little tiny spoiler in Crash of the Titans. Once you climb up the uh, skyscraper, there's a robot in there. Uh, and I'm, I want to say I might have this wrong, so it might not be that much of a spoiler. But if it doesn't recognize you, it just tr straight tries to sweep you and clean you out the window. Like throw you out the window <laughs> like garbage and throw you 20 <laughs> stories down. Whew, that's mean. But Bruce, how can you uh, achieve mastery and dominance over these AIs? How can you bend their will to yours? Well, you have to give them what they want because, as I said, they always have an agenda, right? I've never run into one of these in a game that didn't have something like it wanted something or was trying to achieve something, whether it was, you know, ancient commands that are now obsolete 
or something current. Um, uh, without being spoiler, I recently played, I think it was Into the Glowing Depths. There's an AI there that's got a plan and it wants you to do things. But it's really generous. You just have to, you know, as a give and take. All right. And I think our last question for James was when does an AI become a patron AI? So you might have, you know, a smart toaster or a smart thermostat. And this smart thermostat wants to freeze the entire planet, right? He wants to get rid of this jungle. It's too hot in Terra AD. He's got to work constantly, and he's trying to ice the whole planet. When does this smart thermostat become a patron AI? When it becomes entertaining in the narrative. <laughs> That's the only How criteria. If it's fun, if we're having fun with it, and if it's you know, interesting or in any way, then, you know, yes, your toaster or your thermostat or your, um, you know, your alarm clock would be an AI. There you go. I think one of our answers that we came up with is that it had to have a follower. It had to have somebody willing to uh, do its bidding. I think that was my Absolutely. answer. I, th I think so. <laughs> when what I think of the kind of between there's probably a stepping stone in between, you know, Mangala and the ones that are like up in the atmosphere, their old satellites or something like that. And, and a toaster that has one follower. And I think, you know, uh, if it's probably a touch point for some folks out there, but the, the old world blues, uh, DLC for fallout, new Vegas, where you have a region and there's AI that's very influential over this one region. So I don't know you're doing that in your own game maybe you got to stick to a certain area to get the boosts to get to be able to get in touch with your your patron ai or be able to download new wetware uh but and it's up to you to to enlarge that region oh that that smart thermostat idea is growing on me like you can give wetware like control temperature and stuff like that listen i the toaster's growing on me the brave little toaster's gonna get real big all right. Well, our next episode, Stefan, Bruce, uh, we had C. Aaron Creter from Studio 9 on here. Aaron writes, uh, you know, modules like Strange Night, Pine Pony, 101 Sitting Encounter, stuff like that. He's working on a, a new Purple Planet hex crawl. But Stefan, what was the first question from uh, that episode, if you got it? Uh, yeah, we asked him, what type of healing do MCC healers actually provide? And so the reason this question came up, Bruce, is because they can't read. Nobody, nobody there can read. Uh, everything's passed down traditionally from, like, shaman to little student. Um, so they are adept at healing qualities. But we're wondering, it's DCC healing is magical, right? Mm -hmm. So we kind of compare everything to DCC, uh, which is MCC's bigger brother. So where does this healing come from for the healer class? It's a mutation. It's a genetic mutation that's passed down um, from, you know, progeny. Um, some people have it. And if you have it, you, so this is my interpretation. You can use it to knit tissues and mend veins and bones and all those sort of things. Uh, um, yeah, that's how I, that's how I play it. Okay. Nice. Interesting. I think well, that was there was different many from the other spots we went. So, but th that is, I, I can't recall if that's one of the options, but it gets me thinking about new, uh, that option specifically, at least. I like it. I think there was, uh, I think there wasn't really any criteria. It could be any option because there was like acupuncture, herbology, you know, holistic remedies, you know, uh, medicine man, uh, smoke, aromatherapy. So it can be whatever. Uh, and I kind of like that approach because the mutation healing kind of goes with MCC and mutations in general. All right. I think well, so. What was our, our next, next question? One was is really interesting too. Yeah. Sorry. You get it, Matt. Is it your turn or is it my turn? No, nah, it's your turn. I'm jumping around. All right. Well, this episode was kind of all about healers, Bruce. And we said, next question was what benefits do healers receive when using healing artifacts of the ancients? And the reason I asked this question was because the Sentinel, they get an extra D3, right? Mm -hmm. they, they get that extra D3, 
when the rover is, you know, specifying doing security checks and stuff like that, they get an extra bonus on top. And so the healer, they just kind of get that pure strain human bonus. They don't get an extra healing bonus to uh, artifact checks. Is that right, Stefan? That's right. That They get plus 1D to using healing artifacts. So they but, have to uh, figure it out first before they get the bonus. Yeah, and that's so, what Jim was telling us. I, I think I was being generous and saying, yeah, sure, on the artifact check itself as well. But Jim Wampler was telling us, no, that's that's just on the... You know, the actual healing die check, you know, make your D8 of healing a D10 of healing. And so going off on your mutation that all healers have this mutation built in them from the age they grew up in, the times they grew up in, that would that apply to if I find a, you know, a stim shot from the ancients? Does that help me figure out what it is? You know, I would say no. I would say maybe the healer is a class, right? It's more than just that the healing you know, action that it does. Maybe it was like an oral tradition amongst these people. They don't just have this inherited ability. They join like a class of like healers that pass these, you know, in, this knowledge down. And maybe they, part of that is understanding some of, you know, the healing knowledge of the ancients or mm -hmm. even practical medicine itself. Now, if they can figure out one, if you could just figure out one artifact, I could almost see like a tiered or a stacking kind of combination. Because as you gain that medical knowledge, you know, once I figure out how to use a stem shot, well, I can definitely figure out how to use a rad shot, right? Uh, you know, once I figure out how to use the paddles on the uh, lifesaver device then I might be able to use, you know, something else. I might be able to figure out the EKG machine or something. Uh, that's a big I don't joke. know about that's that. A, that's <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm saying, like, in the future, we got all these proprietary technologies that are 10,000 years old. Oh, but this one's 8,000 years old, and this one's 11,000. Like, the, the jumps in between the random junk you're going to find, they're not all made at the same area, and there was different... OSHA requirements or FDA requirements at you know in different places when when they each got made and company A didn't want you to be able to you know use that you know aftermarket part that worked with company B so they're all going to be totally different and and you know I could see the argument for like yeah you learned how to use that stim shot but this is a different kind of stim shot um but uh going that far might be a little bit mean um, but I can see the argument for. I think the learning arc. I think the learning arc would be really erratic, right? But it would go up over time. But I think that the game scales it that way as you go up in levels, right? Those things you get better at them. You have better modifiers and whatnot, which mm -hmm. might represent the sort of happenstance way you would learn and gain that acumen through trial and error. Well, so I mean, to speak on your point there. I didn't even think about that. You know, being a different with different companies and stuff. So my nephew and my kid, one of my kids, they always had these little inhalers, right? And you shoot it, you squeeze it, and it spits out, and you breathe it in. And then my nephew came to visit last year, and he had an inhaler where you push it down, and then you have to release it, and then it shoots. I said, well, how stupid is that? I said, you learned for 30 years to you know squeeze it, and it blows out, but now you got to squeeze it and release, and it blows out. Yeah. I was like, what? I was like, what a... Whoever, pharmaceutical <laughs> well, idiot. Whole, like, when's the last time you tried to repair your own car or switch out things? You got to make sure that the thing is perfect for that make and model. It's only good for these three years, and then they change things on you. So, you know, a, a 10,000 years into the future, yeah, go ahead. Try to repair that bubble car. Find the that, right part. I dare you. <laughs> that, that's why you got to get the book. The book has a... <laughs> yeah, find the user manual. All right, uh, I think it's your turn, Stefan. Yeah, uh, then we started talking about archaic alignments. Um, so just kind of broad question, what are archaic alignments uh, to you, Bruce? Um, well, they're, they're like clans, right? Um, everybody wants to associate themselves with a group of some sort. Um, but, um, you know, I have actually mixed feelings about those in MCC because they can be really... Um, offer a lot of um, benefit and it can be a little uneven. Um, they're interesting. 
Um, I, uh, um, that's like, you don't lean on them too much though in your games. Not heavily. If, um, and if they want them, like, um, you know, you have to go through the trial, right? I do. I do like to stick to that. There's some sort of, you don't just gain it. Uh, you, uh, you know, you have to do whatever is some sort of trial, right. From your tribe. Some way to join. Like, yeah. so I guess rules as written would be, they, it offers them as they can be an option to either of those clans. So rules is written, but I think I know where you're talking about. Cause there's one, I think it's the mutant class maybe. And they can be uh, children of the glow or something, and they get a plus mm-hmm. five to uh, mutation checks. And I was like, somebody used that the first time, and I was like, what? I was like, where are you getting this plus five from? Yeah. And uh, I had to look it up. And yeah, it does definitely skew the numbers in that person's favor very easily. And especially oh, yeah. at first level, you know, they're way more powerful than any of the clan of the cog people. Absolutely, so, uh, yeah. Is, is that what uh, there's some real benefit to it yeah. if, if you're going hard on those. I mean, well, and, and manimals can start out with the the children of, or the chosen zoo. I really do like the initiation factor. Like, yeah, if you want to be, uh, you know, part of the chosen zoo, you have to go through this initiation. You got to prove yourself. Because, mm-hmm. you know, this is Terra AD, Stefan. We can't take care of people that are just can't take care of themselves. They need to bring a benefit to our tribe. Yeah. Right. You know, it's like the the children of the glow qualifier, you know, that that hazing ritual is like spend one week in a known radioactive area and survive. And, uh, you know, that sounds kind of like, you know, hey, may, maybe that's the solo adventure that's yet to be written, because that definitely sounds like it's got a high chance of you dying. I, I don't know how to, and, you know, and you, and you can't just. All right. Everyone gather here. First hour of the game is going to be me and uh, Craig just doing a one-on-one you can't do that that's <laughs> be trap for everybody else so now question four i think we actually moved to the uh, next episode and we talked to jim about this uh so let's go right to uh question five here and so question five is we talked about the holy medicinal order mm-hmm. and so this is the high class um archaic alignment bruce where these are like the super healers they know kind of every medical mm-hmm. technique on the planet so far, but they have forsworn violence. They will not commit violence against another sentient person. Um, and as such, they should never get attacked by a sentient person. Uh, so the question was, is our healers in a, your game able to join the Holy Medicinal Order and get those benefits? Well, um, I think that I think that being that level of protection requires a cooperation from uh, people who probably just want to kill you. So I think that's yeah. probably wishful thinking to get that outside of your own tribe or your own sect or whatever. And, and I'll say it says that in, in joining that you swear to forever give up all martial arts and combat under pain of excommunication. It's you don't get to commit violence against non-sentient beings. That scorpion monster in the wilderness, you can't do anything except, you know, run. Maybe try to trap it and not harm it, but it can do some violence to you. So it non-sentient, so non-sentient creatures apply to you. Just can't do any kind of violence. I mean, it it says forever give up martial arts and combat. So I'm that's what I would assume. So on page 146, it says members are universally treated as non-combatants by all virtually all sentient living beings. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that means they can't be harmed by anyone who, you know, is any part of any clan, I would guess. If they're not part of an archaic alignment, then they really don't uh, follow suit of not harming your healer. But yeah, are you talking about page 146 also? Yeah, same same entry. I was talking about the the people in the order. I don't think that they can do violence, definitely not to sentient beings, and I don't think they can do violent to non sentient beings either. They they can't go out and, you know, slaughter a cow. Yeah. That, 
It is. Uh, they just give up all forms of violence and martial arts. Yeah, I, I'm, apologies for uh, that miscommunication there. I had. So uh, they can't it, attack. Period. It makes for some interesting role play for that character. You know, uh, in the M- very violent and dangerous MCC world. And how would they feel about the rest of the party? You know, attacking and killing everything. Would they try to heal it? Quite possibly. I, I know they're probably going to go on a quest for a net gun or something like that. They can yeah, trap I things. Mean, I think we'll uh, maybe in the MCC annual, the uh, archaic alignments will get broken <laughs> out even further. Maybe. All right. Uh, I think then we went on to episode 32, Stefan, uh, where we had Jim Warpler on. And uh, if you want to hit us with our first question. Absolutely. So it was, what is the metagenesis? Which I think I've been saying mutagenesis for years, but it's the metagenesis. I have too. <laughs> <laughs> so the metagenesis is between uh, level zero and level one, Bruce. And that's when the mammals, plantians, and mutants get their mutations. So how does that, it's, you know, it, it's from going from zero level to first level in DCC. You know how everybody always kind of says, well, how do they get their magic? You know, how do they train to be a warrior? Uh, in MCC world, how is that transition for you? So, um, well, they've gone through their trial, right? Their trial uh, to become members of the tribe by surviving, you know, their funnel, you know, uh, you know, theoretically. Um, and, uh, so, you know, I think that there's some some hand waving of, you know, mechanics in here, but I mean they're mutants. A mutant, um, the tribe probably has some way of like uh, accelerating uh, their latent mutant powers, something like that. I, I this one I haven't actually given it that much thought, but uh, you think that a mutant is they have what they have, they've been exposed and they've mutated, right? So whatever they have is natural, or maybe they're just latent until they've uh, proven themselves. And then there's some way that their tribal elders or whatever, you know, you know bring so out on their page, potential. To expand upon it a little more for you, on page 34, it says, during the metagenesis is when their genetic code fully blossoms. Mm-hmm. So these extreme circumstances that they faced in like zero level have exploded this code and that's how it it develops these life threatening conditions that they were forced to survive. As most of, you know, not necessarily, but most of the people going through this, they're going to be the the teenagers going through their rite of passage. Uh, I think you could pretty easily describe some, like, well, all right, what did you roll for your mutations? You got this, this, and that. All right, here's how I described that version of the Peter Parker gets bit by a, a spider montage scene of he's figuring out all his powers from Spider-Man 1 with, with the Tobey Maguire version. You know, he's going, oh, I went something. Uh, and you're doing that, except you have wings now, and you're like, you know, bumping into everybody, and you wake up the next day. You didn't go to the hospital either, because there's no hospitals anymore, and you're just going, oh, what's happening to me? Well, our next question, I'm going to combine the next two, Stefan. So what different types of mutations are there in MCC, Bruce, and how are those mutations determined? So when you're running a higher than zero level game and you've got a man, manimal plantian mutant that has mutations, what kind of mutations can they get, and how do you determine those mutations? Um, I do it by the book, just all randomized in a table. So we do. That's how I do it. I just do the standard rolls, where um, you know I think it's a. A D4, like a mutant gets a D4 of mutations. And then, you know, various kinds. You've got physical, you've got mental, you've got latent, or I'm sorry. So there's, there's, um, I forget the terminology. There's triggered ones and there's ones that are uh, active and passive. Active and passive. Thank you. Yes. Um, but no, I like to randomize that. I mean, they're mutations. You got exposed to some stuff and something weird happened. Let's make it random. Now, I've got to ask, in all the times that you've played or ran a game, 
have you ever had on your character or had a player with a mega mutation? Yeah, actually, in uh, our friend Darren, uh, I've played some MCC with him, and I have a very uh, extremely mutated character. He's kept running into radioactivity and getting more mutations. And uh, yeah, and this uh, it's level three at this point, and uh, it's really messed up physically. But he's a room clearer. He's got like mag. <laughs> Uh, he's got like magnetic control and mental blast with huge modifiers on them. And, uh, but yeah, he's messed up in a lot of ways, but he's like, he's the tank of the party just like clears out rooms and yards full of enemies. All right, cool. Stephen, you got our last question for Jim. I'm going to give Bruce yeah, the secret symbol. Yeah, it was, who are the clan of Cog? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, um, well, those are the uh, worshippers of machinery and the, the machina of the ancients. So everybody kind of starts out as clan of the Cog. Um, is that usually where all your characters start out, Bruce, if you're running the game? No, I leave it up to them. And uh, they can, and you know, I'm fine with you identifying yourself. Like if you haven't gone through the initiation, you know, um, you know, you can maybe you're like a, pro, a pro, probationary clan member, right? Um, but uh, but if you want to get be a full member, you know, you have to go through the initiation. But uh, but no, I'm fine with using them. Um, I did, you know, as I said, I think one of them's a little unbalanced, but. Uh, uh, but most of them, I think they add a lot of color to the game. I like to see if a player's leverage that, animals running into each other and, and doing secret signs and talking to each other and barks and yips and stuff while everybody else is going, what are they talking about? Have you uh, have you thought about introducing any new archaic alignments? Like, I think, I don't know if we brought this up, Stefan, but, you know, so when I'm envisioning these archaic alignments and they all have territory, this is how I envision it now. And like talking about the rules, I'm like figuring out all these nuances that I want to kind of implement in my MCC games. But now I'm kind of envisioning it like the Warriors, where you got gangs, you know, and you know some of them are friendly. But then you introduced me to the Vile Brotherhood, you know, last week or uh, last session, uh, and so that's kind of where I'm where I'm at now. That it's like territories. Have you ever thought about adding or introducing any other archaic alignments, Bruce? Um, not necessarily, but I love that idea of clans and uh, like roaming gangs and stuff. I mean, that's classic post-apocalyptic mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So I am all for that. And I've played in games with those are apart. I put like, yeah, if you're out on the in the wastelands, I love like a roaming gang of scavengers or something to throw into the mix. I love that too. And anything we can do to make our our games more like the warriors is generally a good idea but and your players will do surprising things that could turn into like a parlay that opens up some kind of weird door right it's a, you know new narrative opportunities or a benefit for the players instead of a fight well and because when you think about it when we're in these modules when we're playing them we kind of have like tunnel vision like we're seeker team a or b or c or we might even be seeker team f you know if we're just starting out but we're the seeker team going to find this one thing and if we're going to find it from our tiny little clan, then, you know, the Holy Medicinal Order is probably looking for it, or, or the Chosen Zoo are probably looking for it, or, you know, the mimes down the road, they're all, everybody's <laughs> looking for it. So there's going to be all kinds of seeker teams that are in possibly this little hallway that we're going on this adventure. And I never really thought about it like that. Absolutely. Yeah, there, I, in, uh, Speaking of playing with Darren, he wrote a fun little adventure in my mysteries of the multiverse scene, and I put some good stuff over like bandits and stuff in there. Because yeah, with it, MCC knee, it had there's a few adventures with it, but like more rival weird adventuring parties, you don't see that enough, I think. Because mm -hmm. you can have I don't know have some really cool like strangely themed uh, mutant group or and and just have so much fun with it. Yeah. All right, Bruce. Well, now we're going to hit you up with uh, Bob's questions. And I, I know you didn't have time to prepare for these, but okay. our first question is, 
Elaine, if you could bring up question one, um, what is Radburn? Oh, well, Radburn is, you know, burning your stats to enhance your mutations, right? Your, um, your active mutations. All right. So I'm going to stop you right there because that's a common uh, miscommunication. There's Glowburn and then there's Radburn. So oh, Radburn, okay, I yeah, really yeah. didn't even know what it was either. That's exposure uh, to I, radiation. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, Elena, if you could bring up handout 1A, uh, page 42, exposure to high levels of radiation may add or subtract mutations from mutant, mammal, or plantian character that is level 1 or higher. This is called Radburn. Luck cannot change these results as they only occur on a roll of natural 1 or 20. Now, Stefan and Bruce, that mm -hmm. text right there, we can bring that all the way back to DCC in our previous conversations of can you add luck to make a natural 20. And, you know, I think that was, you know, some kind of contention. Uh, well, or, or to make it like, hey, I've got a plus... Crit. X or whatever on my thing. What I didn't get a one. I got a one plus my bonuses. No, you got a one. That's the one doesn't change, and the tw I mean the twenty can get some stuff added to it, but its status as a twenty is still important more than in you know a status as a nineteen or a twenty one if you're rolling a higher die type. So how strict are you with that, Bruce? If they, uh, you know, I think seeking the uh, posthumans. Uh, there's a you know a nuclear reactor in there or something. How strict are you with exposure to radiation? And you're rolling a fort save, and if they roll a one or a twenty, it's lose or gain a mutation. Oh, go for it. That's part of the game. No, that's my favorite part of the game. Uh, is it a character I was just describing? That's happened like three times. They would find things. Oh, look at this cool thing I found, and all of a sudden your Geiger counter goes crazy, mm -hmm. and then the you know, Darren's like, okay, you got a mutation, and uh, no, I love that. That's a great part of the game. Uh, that's it's in the um, you know mut more mutations and more mutations is my policy. Yeah, and and, it, and it's like specifically radiation based fortitude saves or related fortitude saves. You know, if it's a fortitude save because you got struck by lightning, unless it's rad lightning, you're not <laughs> going to get a mutation out of it. Well, Elena, if you could bring up handout 1B for us, page 42 goes on to say that whenever a mutant character is forced to make a fortitude save uh, versus radiation-based damage, a result of a natural one means they lose one random mutation or defect. They don't get a pick. Completely random. Note that that character... Note that, note that should a mutated character lose all of their mutations, they revert back to their base genotype. So mutant PCs become pure strain humans and can no longer gain mutations. Uh, we'll talk about mammals and plantains in a second, but Bruce, that makes your mutant no longer a mutant. Theoretically. They, what, yeah. what do you do at that point? Because then now their DNA has become so hardened, they can't gain more mutations. They're pure well, they strain still human. Gain more mutations, I think. No? No, I they're rad, rad, so. rad proof. <laughs> I, rules is written. I think it says they can no longer gain mutations. You know, I think I'm thinking of the the mammals and the the plantians. They'll become a plant or a or a raccoon. Yeah, they can oh, still get uh, remutated, but yeah. And there's a, there's totally a correct. definite yes. specification there that you you strain humans. So Bruce, you've got a third level guy. He loses all his mutations. What do you do at that point? Does he pick a different class that he wouldn't have been in the first place? Or is he just a human named Fred? Um, I think they would have to I you know what? That person might just be a level one with a pure strain human class. Go back to level one and have to start over. Get some training and a different job. Or maybe, you know, maybe with a sort of a bonus on XP, because they do have some experience, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know if I make Half it go their through total the XP or something. Something, Yeah, maybe nerf it a little bit, but I like that idea of just like you're starting out from, because it's like you look at fantasy literature as characters that lose their abilities, right? And they have to go like, oh, what do I do? I'm starting over. 
right? I like that. Okay, Elena, if you could bring up handout 1C for us on page 42, this is the chart um, right here for Radburn. So if they roll a natural 1 on a radiation fortitude save or a natural 20, they would roll another D20 and you would check this chart. Well, actually, let me take that back. If they roll a natural 20, you're going to roll and apply this chart. If they roll a natural one, they just randomly lose however mutations they got. So if they have five mutations, you roll a 1d5. Yeah. Is that how you understand it, Stefan? That, yeah, that's how I would do it. Yeah. We'll roll 1d5 or however many they got. Exactly. Choose the die. All right. So we do have two more handouts for this one. And Lane, if you could bring up handout 1d and 1e in succession, uh, however much time you would like to have them up. But this is, Stefan, this is what you're talking about. Manimals who are exposed to radiation and other mutagens and sometimes even lose them, uh, they devolve to their base animal stock with an intelligence of 1d3, but they may gain additional mutations later to regain that stuff. So your bison man just becomes a, a, a cow. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a two-headed cow, but he's he's still got a one d three intelligence. Not if he loses his double head. That's right. Wow. That's a mutation. Who knows? You know, so your plantient is the same thing. Hand out one e. Uh, your plantient becomes a regular tree or a shrub. You know, I, I said two-headed because who knows what a regular cow looks like in ten thousand years. And so there's even a picture with that one that shows. Somebody carrying a little potted plant, like a little Groot, because <laughs> the plant has devolved and it can't walk anymore. So you're carrying that character around, and uh, it doesn't have any mutations going on. Yeah, I, I, d I definitely I, I, let let them add like a little flavor to it. If if that character had like you know silver skin, uh, you know, hey, that that plant, it's a silver leaf plant, or if they had like a you know, a defect that made them like consume twice as much food every day. I'd be like, yeah, that plant needs some extra water. What do you think, Bruce? What would you do at that point? If uh, you're, let's say you got a plantient with one mutation, they lose it in the middle of a game and now they're a regular plant. Uh, I think it maybe it's your time to retire that. Uh, there's not a whole lot you can do at that point. Have somebody carry you around and hope for a mutation that gives you, I don't know, something because are you even sentient at that point no i don't that's a good question I uh, yeah one d3 uh, you find all those cortex cylinder things the role so, play opportunities are slim at that point i think <laughs> so that brings up a good point if i've got that plantian or if i'm holding stefan and stefan's my little plantian if i just keep dipping him in the radiation pool over and over <laughs> to make him roll would you allow that Come on, Stefan. Come on. I think you might be both be making the role. For the I, rad I'd say you, you have to wait until I dry off at least to try again. Uh, <laughs> maybe maybe wait a day for each attempt. I'd, something like that, you know. It, it's no fun to just go, all right, just keep on rolling a D20 until you, you get high or low. Yeah, um, that would be kind of abusing it. Yeah, I, I do like having like a day in between or something. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I would treat that like just like a a dead PC or a dead zero. It's that yeah. one's got to be replaced. I, I would say alternatively, bottle some and just that's what you water your plant with every day. That's great. So, yeah, that's get, a great idea. Go on, keep walking. Go on to the, your quest. Hopefully, <laughs> halfway through the dungeon, he's going to become a real boy. <laughs> All right, Bruce. Uh, well, we've got a cor cr corporate crash course uh, coming on after us. So if uh, you have not seen them, make sure you guys stick tuned. Um, mm -hmm. Make sure you give us a like or a follow on our Twitch channel. We appreciate you guys turning in, uh, turning in to watch. Bruce, thank you so much for coming on as a guest. Is there anything you would like to leave us with? Oh, just thanks for having me. It was really fun. I'm a fan of the show, and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about mcc with y'all uh stephanie you got anything coming up anything going on 
Uh, well, I'll see tomorrow. I'm I'm releasing. Uh, I got a Substack newsletter. It's DragonPeakPublishing.substack.com. And tomorrow I'm coming out with. Uh, I've been doing interviews with DCC and MCC creators, folks in the community, and uh, Tim Satley, who's got a Kickstarter going on right now. Horror at the Merc. Got an interview with him coming out. So uh, check it out over there. And uh, and I got my own little Kickstarter. I'll I'll drop. I dropped the link in the chat earlier for something I'm not the writer of, but I'm doing a lot of help with called um, it's D it's a very science fantasy DCC. Go, go fight some aliens and, you know, get some weird tech uh, called prisoners of the secret overlords. And it's going to be like a 56 page long adventure. So it's, it's a big one and that'll be launching on Kickstarter in a couple weeks. Nice. Very nice. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. Um, DCC 100 is shipping. So check your mailboxes for that. Uh, let's see. There was something. Oh, Road Crew Game Day is coming up this weekend, I believe. Yes, um, sir. You've still got a small chance to get any games in if you want to run games for other judges. But this is it for you're a judge out there. If there's any spots left, go sign up for the games. Um, and then we've got Long Con coming up in November. And Eddie and Matt, I submitted my games, and they said, we're full for Thursday. It can't be full. I'll find players. Approve those games. Uh, but thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks uh, with our guest, Julian Burnick. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, guys. Okay.